Welcome back from lunch, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick off the afternoon session following lunch and the poster session with our second panel of the day entitled Hydrogen's Role in a Decarbonized Energy System. The, the, this panel is, is here to tackle hydrogen's potentially significant role in the decarbonized energy system as a fuel for dispatchable on-demand power sources for both mobile as well as stationary applications. Our moderator for this panel is Professor Michael Mueller, Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton. Michael's interests encompass multi-physics computational modeling of turbulent reacting flows with applications to energy and propulsion, including combustion as well as offshore wind, fusion, and other energy conversion uh, processes. In addition, his research extends to broader areas of computational and data sciences, including uncertainty quantification, numerical algorithms for emerging parallel computing architectures, and data-based modeling and algorithms. Since 2020, he's, he's been jointly appointed as a faculty researcher at NREL. He has been recognized through some awards, such as the Young Investigator Program of the Army Research Office and a Research Excellence Award from the Combustion Institute. He's also received Princeton University's uh, Graduate Mentoring Award and named to the Princeton Engineering Commendation List for Outstanding Teaching seven times between 2013 and 2020. Let's welcome Michael Mueller. All right, well, thank you, everyone, and welcome back from lunch. And, you know, the goal of a panel after lunch is always to make sure that our audience doesn't have a nap after a good lunch. <laughs> so I think we have a really exciting topic uh, that'll, that'll seed a lot of discussion. And so before we get started, I want to introduce uh, my fellow panelists. Um, uh, first, we have Professor Tom Dura, who's a professor in the School of Earth Sciences at The Ohio State University. Um, his expertise is in uh, gas ge geochemistry, subsurface science, um, and geological hydrogen, which will be what he talks about. In addition, he's an entrepreneur. He's the co-founder and CTO of Coloma, which is a company in that space. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Jeff Goldmere, who's at uh, GE uh, Venova. Um, he's in charge of their strategy for their hydrogen value chain at uh, the company. Um, he has uh, other uh, activities uh, in previous roles at GE in gas turbines, including hydrogen blending things like that. Before that, he got his PhD at Case Western, so there's a bit of a Ohio flavor here to start. Um, and then he was a postdoc at NASA Langley, and then a, a research scientist at Southwest Science. Our, our next panelist is uh, Jen Kurtz, who is the uh, director of the, I always get it wrong, so I have to go to my notes here. So I'm not looking at messages, I'm just getting it right. <laughs> yeah, she's the director of the Energy Conversion and Storage Systems Center at NREL and also one of the principal scientists and technical lead in the advanced research on integrated energy systems um, at NREL. And the word integrated is something that came up in our keynote uh, this morning. So it's, it's certainly something that this panel will uh, address. And then uh, finally, my colleague, uh, Professor Milkray Porporato, who is a uh, professor in civil and environmental engineering in the High Meadows Environmental Institute. Uh, his expertise uh, really spans uh, the full spectrum of environmental engineering from soil and water uh, to atmospheric uh, processes. So I just want to set the table. My fellow panelists will bring the main dishes, but we need some forks, we need some knives to get started with that. And so I'll talk a bit about um, hydrogen. With some headlines first. Hydrogen's been in the news recently, um, and things very local to us. So uh, a headline from the New York Times uh, announcing the Hydrogen Hubs, which is a recent investment of many billions of dollars at various sites around the country using different technologies to produce hydrogen in different ways. New Jersey is part of one of those where we're using renewable and nuclear electricity to electrolyze water to get um, hydrogen. Other regions have different approaches that they're using as well. And then uh, PPPL, in collaboration with the university, was awarded an earth shot on, on making hydrogen, a $5 million center led by my colleague, um, Professor Yves Wang Zhu. Uh, and there, their process is to do methane pyrolysis, which is to produce um, hydrogen from methane and then use the carbon that's left over to do uh, other things with the solids. Uh, so it's something that's uh, very timely, something that's very active, and that the, the federal government certainly is investing um, a lot in. The hydrogen ecosystem itself is quite uh, broad. It goes from uh, issues associated with production, with then turning the hydrogen into other things, um, and then how you use it. And you can use it for things like burning, which is what I get very excited about as a combustion scientist. 
but you can use it as other things in other industrial processes as a reduction agent um, and things like that. And so there's a lot of questions about what's the best use of hydrogen uh, there. And you don't have to leave hydrogen as hydrogen. You can combine it with carbon dioxide, perhaps, that you've captured to turn it into a synthetic fuel. Um, I don't like this chart. There's a molecule there. It's like a fused cyclohexene. I need a chemist to tell me what that's useful for. It's not a fuel. I've never really seen it before uh, there. Or something else that we'll talk about on this panel as well. You can make ammonia from hydrogen um, as well. And what could we use ammonia for um, uh, there? So I'll say a couple of things about production and then ammonia, and then I'll pass it off to my fellow panelists. So hydrogen production is a very interesting thing. There's this rainbow of different colors that uh, are different uh, production processes. And so most of our hydrogen we make today for uh, industry is what's called gray hydrogen, which is uh, from natural gas, and you just release carbon dioxide um, there. Blue hydrogen is another color where you then sequester that carbon dioxide. The PPPL uh, grant is really on turquoise hydrogen, where you don't sequester CO2. You take solid carbon and do something with that uh, useful. Then there's green hydrogen, which is just electrolysis uh, to get hydrogen uh, from water. And then there's white and gold hydrogen, which are essentially naturally occurring forms of hydrogen that we could exploit, which um, uh, Tom will, will talk about. Then you could do something else with the hydrogen. You could transform it to something else. And ammonia is something that uh, is, is seeing uh, more interest. And the reason is, is ammonia is much easier to move around uh, than hydrogen. Hydrogen is a gas. It's not particularly dense um, on a volumetric basis. Um, if you convert it to ammonia, ammonia is about as easy to store and move around as propane. So you can turn it into a liquid. Uh, liquids are much easier to move around. It's much uh, higher volumetric energy density. Um, compared to traditional hydrocarbons, uh, if you want to say talk about uh, the combustion process, um, hydrogen burns too fast, uh, so that's a challenge. Ammonia burns too slow. That's the complete uh, opposite challenge as well. So from a, a combustion technology standpoint for gas turbines, uh, they kind of pose opposite problems um, in terms of technology development. So that's just a little bit to get us started here. I'll uh, pass the baton now to each of my uh, panelists to kind of give you a bit of a deep dive on each of their respective areas of expertise. And then we'll have a few questions. And then the fun part is always to open it up to you all to see uh, what you would like to discuss as well. So uh, well, uh, thank you all for having me. Um, I'm talking about something today, uh, geologic hydrogen. That I, think, that I think might be a bit different than, than most of the other panelists are going to talk about. So um, how many people here have ever even heard of geologic hydrogen? OK, so probably more than I might have expected, actually. Um, so you know, this is uh, something that people have been talking about for a long time. There are, there are wells that have been drilled for other purposes around the world where people have identified uh, hydrogen in the gas, and in some cases, really high hydrogen. It's really been in about the last decade. Uh, where people have started to intentionally think about looking for this. Um, and, and what I show here is a graph of, you know, put out by the USGS. And what this is, is basically looks at the various mechanisms by which hydrogen can be made in the subsurface. I won't go into all of them for you, uh, but there, there are two that people have talked about a lot. One is uh, the naturally occurring radioactive decay of uranium and thorium interacts with water and makes hydrogen at pretty known quantifiable amounts in the subsurface. Um, and the emplacement of, uh, for any geologists in the room or geochemists I saw on the panel earlier, the emplacement of particular types of volcanic rocks, namely mafic rocks, have large volumes of reduced forms of iron that if they undergo water rock interactions, uh, something we call serpentinization, can also make hydrogen in the subsurface. And really, um, everyone is in the, ge in the geochemistry uh, community has known about this for, I think, you know, quite a long time now. It's been pretty well studied. The conventional wisdom I think has been that this wasn't something that would happen at prolific enough rates, or more importantly, uh, I think that things like microbes and chemical reactions would uh, consume the hydrogen in the subsurface, that there weren't going to be what I would call an exclusionary environment where this could accumulate in the subsurface. You know, if I take it back to the last, last few decades, people have drilled more wells and different types of geology for different things. We, we've learned that's not really the case. In fact, we've learned that um, in, in the right geological conditions, uh, particularly the serpentinization reaction, really cons uh, similar to what some of the folks talked about this morning in terms of carbon mineralization, some similar uh, reactions actually can produce hydrogen in pretty significant quantities. Um, and by learning how to look for exclusionary environments, we can identify locations in the subsurface where that gas can accumulate. So, you know, other than being another color on the hydrogen uh, spectrum, what, what does this mean? Well, 
Uh, putting this in perspective, if you look at the mass of potential source rock for hydrogen generation, it actually exceeds the potential source rocks that are abundant, uh, that are present for oil and gas generation. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same, but um, a lot, lot, to, lot to work out there. But uh, giving you a sense of the scale, is about 12% of the Earth's continental crust contains the right source rock to generate hydrogen. And there have been various people, as I mentioned, looked at this in different aspects at different times. Um, so why, why has this gotten a lot of attention in, uh, recently? I, I think a big as, uh, aspect of this is, is academic curiosity. There, that's been going on since the earliest part of my career where you go to a conference and I can tell you there are a lot less people in the room talking about geologic hydrogen than we have here today. We've seen the academic interest certainly increase, uh, uh, but what we actually see now is that you know, about you know, within the last decade, uh, wells have been drilled um, looking for water in, in West Africa, in a place called in Mali, where people are producing hydrogen in relatively modest volumes for a sustained period of time now. And people started to understand that this is actually a resource we can, we can look at the subsurface. I should say, in addition to these, these processes of natural, uh, natural activities, there's also um, a, a recent attempt to actually use sort of geoengineering to modulate these reactions on the subsurface, much like the panelists who talked this morning about carbon sequestration are doing. And that's an area we, we're thinking about a lot as well. Uh, so just to give you a sense, as I already said, it's, you know, it can be up to 12% of the Earth's continental crust. Uh, there are many places in the US and around the, around the world. Uh, you'll note, uh, for, for the geologists in the room, there's in addition to being expansive resources, also a, a pretty different, pretty big difference in the type of geological settings where you find this type of re resource as compared to oil and gas. So there's a lot of potentially geologic or ge geopolitical implications to where this resource can be found and where people are interested in looking at it. But you know, suffice it to say, without giving away uh, too much detail, the U.S. is actually extremely well positioned for for this type of resource, as, as are many locations uh, around the world. At least for this group, I think this is what to me matters the most. Right? We talked this morning about various, various aspects of the economics and how these things get integrated. In my mind, this is what I'm most excited about. This is what matters the most. Uh, if geologic hydrogen at these extremely large volumes of source rock can be found in accumulations, there's, there's a couple things that matter. As we talked about all the different colors that Michael introduced, we have a pretty reasonable understanding of where the range of green hydrogen is on a per kilogram basis, or this is in, is in, is in tons of, of hydrogen. Uh, there's, that's gonna, technologies are going to improve, and that, that price is going to become more competitive. Um, the, the, the PTC uh, IRA uh, is going to provide credits to push that down. Uh, blue hydrogen that's, that's made by you know, recombining, or you know, uh, using a steam methane refurbishment and combining it with CCUS or CS, CCS has its own place. What I think is the most exciting and most important thing about geologic hydrogen is, if you look at this map, uh, this graph rather, as you move towards the, the, the lower end of the spectrum, the, the larger volume at the lower cost you can produce, it actually opens up markets for hydrogen that aren't currently really conceived of. It's not, it's not about um, a high value uh, user, but actually being cost competitive. And we, you know, we, we've, uh, you know, early on think this is, this is, you know, effectively where the price of geologic hydrogen is gonna, gonna move towards. And, and, and many other people working on this, I think, have similar, similar ideas. My, my background is, uh, is largely an energy environment as well, so I love, love visiting here. I think this plot is, for me, is actually the thing that, you know, once you think about, is this a new resource? Is this something we can, we can get, you know, cheap hydrogen? Well, what, how do, what are the other environmental implications? And this is some work we've done, um, you know, internally to put this in perspective. Um, I think that the, some of the more exciting aspects of this is that if you look at the particular exploration model we, we've developed looking for low carbon intensity hydrogen, uh, it's not just that we can find potentially large volumes of inexpensive hydrogen, that the carbon intensity actually compares really well to some of the other forms of, of hydrogen solutions. Um, if you think about this in terms of you know, other environmental impacts, water consumption, uh, energy intensity, uh, land footprint, um, in each of those scenarios, I think one of the things besides the price that leaves me most excited is the potential to find this in a way um, where, where, some, where we stack up pretty favorably in those, in those aspects. Um, you know, in broad, broad, broad picture, I think this is a technology along with uh, drilling for natural hydrogen, as mentioned, where you're seeing a lot of in interest now in the, the federal landscape in terms of RPE developing programs to look for um, hydrogen generation by some of those geomimicry processes as well. But thank you very much. I'm just uh, introduced geologic hydrogen, and I'll wait for questions afterwards. Okay. Great. Uh, first, I, again, I want to 
thank the Endlinger Center and, uh, and Michael for the opportunity to come and, and speak with you here today. Really exciting to be, to be part of this, this great panel as we talk uh, all about hydrogen. Um, I'm going to divert for a moment. Um, as introduced, I work for a company called GE Vernova. You're probably all familiar with GE, but the Vernova part might be kind of throwing you a curveball. So it's kind of important for me just to spend a moment. GE is going through what I call probably the largest transformation in the company's 130-year history. The company's literally um, tearing itself apart from the inside intentionally. Um, we are becoming three separate investment-grade companies. Uh, GE Healthcare is separated as of January this year. You can now go buy GE Healthcare stock as an independent company on the exchange. Um, just announced uh, earlier this week, what's left of GE, that's the aerospace division and the energy division, will separate from each other first week of April in 2024, becoming GE Aerospace and GE Vernova. That's Ver for Verdant or Green and Nova for New. And that's the collection of all the existing energy businesses. And, and we're kind of organizing ourselves in kind of three pillars. One is around wind, an onshore and offshore wind business, and our wind turbine blade business. Our, our power businesses, uh, wind, uh, excuse me, um, gas power, steam power, hydrogen, and, and nuclear. And then our electrification business units really focused around uh, grid scale, um, power electronics, HVDC, uh, battery storage. And as we think about kind of, as we think about the company, probably the, the first special purpose built company around decarbonization and electrification having all of these three legs. Plus, we've got our digital teams. We have a financial services group that really helps bring capital and equity to, to projects that we're doing, especially when you talk about billion dollar kind of projects at scale. Um, and then we have accelerators, including our, our research center in upstate New York. Um, and really helps us think a big picture about how do we do decarbonization, including things like hydrogen. And, and Michael, thanks for introducing the value chain, the ecosystem. I think it's really important because we shouldn't lose sight of, as we think about decarbonizing, so many different aspects of society. There are so many ways to do it, and they're interrelated to each other. There's no one independent system. If we're going to make hydrogen like we do today, right, natural gas, some sort of reforming reaction, hopefully you can then add CCS to that, and now you've got a sequestration discussion. We've had discussions around sequestration and utilization already today. You could use assets that are providing low or zero carbon electricity, wind, nuclear, solar, hydro, you can now take that and transform that energy into hydrogen. Obviously, you've got to manage that electricity, maybe store in the electricity, but now you've got hydrogen and now you've got all sorts of opportunities. That's the, what's the best way to use the hydrogen? Is it power? Is it mobility? Is it to store or transition or, or transport renewable power in ways you can't do otherwise? And then if you do direct air capture, again, we talked about it this morning, now you've got a carbon molecule. What do you do with that? Are you just going to sequester that because you want to reduce the amount of CO2 in the air? Or are you going to pull and remove air from the environment, should be CO2 from the environment, and recycle that now as part of a fuel system? And now you're creating a circular economy. But now these pieces are all interrelated. There is no one piece that's truly standalone. And so we need to be thinking about this as an ecosystem, and hydrogen plays its part in it. At Vernova, I'm really excited because if I look at that value chain and the things we bring and technologies we're talking about, whether it's wind or hydro or inverters or energy storage, advanced research on electrolysis technologies, advanced research on sorbent technologies for carbon capture, we're really trying to advance the dialogue and the technology in this space. And it's about the energy transition. It's about a suite of technologies. There's not one technology in the energy transition. If anything, we learned today is there's a suite of technologies, and it's not an or problem, it's an and problem. We need all of these technologies because the energy transition in the US versus France or Germany and India and Brazil and Australia and Japan and Korea and Singapore, each of these countries, it's on its own decarbonization journey. There will not be a singular global solution that works everywhere. We need a suite of technologies that really provides that balance globally. Now. My background is combustion, so, so like Michael, if we're going to talk about burning stuff, I always get really excited. Um, but I want everyone to realize, we talk about using hydrogen for power generation, that's not a new concept. The industry already has 17 and a half million operator hours of running gas turbines on fuels with hydrogen. Now, a lot of that came about over the last five decades because you had processes that were in refineries or steel mills or oil and gas production where hydrogen was part of the waste gas mix, and instead of flaring it, they put it into a turbine. And this gives you a sense all the major gas turbine OEMs have experience in doing this. This is not a GE thing. This is an industry-wide set of experience. 
Um, and just to give you the, the bigger flavor here, again, you know, we've been doing this. I can literally tell you this. I was in diapers when we started burning our first kind of fuel-based or fuel with hydrogen. It was in the early 70s. So yes, I've dated myself. I'm that old. Um, but we literally have been doing this for decades. What's different now is people are thinking about hydrogen not as a waste fuel, but intentionally looking to find hydrogen as a way to reduce carbon emissions from their power plant. But the gas turbine doesn't care. What it cares about is what does the molecule look like? What's the energy content of the molecule? The engineers care about reliability and operability and safety. But the fundamental chemistry, the fundamental physics of combustion don't change. So that's what's really neat and exciting, that we've got all this experience around using hydrogen. And we've burned fuels with hydrogen content as low as 5%, all the way up to a demonstration we did over a decade ago, burning 100% hydrogen in a gas turbine. So the next thing to take away is if anyone tells you, oh, burning hydrogen in a gas turbine is hard and it's difficult, no. What's difficult is I want to burn hydrogen in a gas turbine, and I want the lowest emissions possible, the highest reliability possible, the lowest cost possible, and, 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 and. You throw all those constraints on life, gets tough. But I want a car that's free and gives me ultimate mileage and... Yeah, the same problem exists. If you overly constrain anything, it gets hard. We've been doing great things with our customers. Um, last year, we partnered with the New York Power Authority. We took an existing gas turbine and ran 44% hydrogen. That's 44% by volume blended with natural gas. We made no changes to the gas turbine. And even better, with the existing after-treatment system, it actually maintained NOx at or below the New York State permit level it had. So again, when people talk about whether well, challenges with NOx and hydrogen, it's, made, it's manageable with existing technology. But like anything else, technology development doesn't stop. We continue to develop next generation technologies, next generation combustion technologies. Michael even alluded, as we think about hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives, we may not be moving hydrogen as hydrogen. Maybe we're going to move it as ammonia, and there's work that we're doing. How do you think about ammonia as a next generation zero carbon fuel? It's got challenges, but there are some opportunities. So, it's really exciting as we think about the whole value chain and what can be done and the role hydrogen will play in that. It's not the solution, but it's one part of the whole solution set. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else thinking with all of this talk on uh, burning things that we should have done this in a lab and, and uh, see what happens? <laughs> and then carefully reviewed safety uh, exits and, and procedures. Uh, Jeff, like you said, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And what I want to do is talk to you a little bit from the research angle from the National Lab perspective. And <clears throat> to just lay out a, a challenge that we're all talking about, our decarbonized energy system has needs, and the urgency attached to those needs is today. We have to be moving faster than what we have. We don't have two decades like what we've done to, to linear and series solve different challenges. And so we're thinking about, uh, from, from my role at NREL, is energy storage and how energy storage can help support this future energy system. And when we break that down a little bit more, there's a handful of attributes, and Jeff, you talked about, about them. Uh, Tom, you, you showed some of those key characteristics. But flexibility, the resiliency, the reliability, accessibility, and sustainability of solutions. Within our research center, we're tackling hydrogen, and also batteries and concentrated solar power, thermal energy storage, uh, hydropower. There's a number of technologies that we can tie together. Uh, and I think we've heard not only around the technology side, but also the efficiency side. And uh, something that's really important to the work that, that we're doing is thinking about it from a systems perspective. How do you break that down to tackle these requirements? And you'll notice I don't actually have costs listed on here. I don't have a, a particular efficiency target listed on here. These characteristics are a little bit broader, are a little bit more challenging, because they can be very difficult for us to quantify as we go through and think about, from a research perspective, what are the right technological solutions, what are the innovation needs, and how are we going to uh, rise to the, to the challenge and the time necessary. So I want to walk you through some of the research uh, capabilities, how we're thinking about that complement 
to folks um, that are, are responsible for the, the implementation and the development of product. One of those things is the advanced research on integrated energy systems, or ARIES. And uh, this is a uh, experimental and virtual platform <laughs> that is designed to study a wide range of different systems. Thinking about how do we verify, how do we validate, how do we find risks and vulnerabilities in a system and do that in a lab setting so that it actually accelerates the deployment once it gets into the field. The diagram on the right-hand side here uh, shows the different aspects of this research platform. We've got uh, two main physical facilities at NREL, um, the Energy Systems Integration Facility going up to about two megawatts, and then a Flatirons Campus facility which goes up to 20 megawatts of hardware capability. On the far right-hand side is the virtual um, environment. What that allows us to do is build off of our understanding of hardware interfaces and interactions and then scale from there. So scale and the system configurations can be uh, greatly increased when we tie both the hardware and the physical aspect, assets together. One other thing uh, that's really important, we've heard a little bit about PPL and uh, so uh, another national lab is tapping into the national lab complex. Uh, we have a Department of Energy Investments and a number of uh, research capabilities and expertise. The challenge that we're facing for this energy transition over the next uh, couple of decades is big enough. We got to uh, pull every part of the national lab system into this to help support um, communities, help support technology providers, the people who are going to be responsible for implementing this. So that's what's highlighted on the bottom of this slide, is looking at those national lab partnerships. I'm here for hydrogen, so I better give you a little bit on hydrogen, right? Um, so we've got, we've got this image, and um, with this image, this is a view from our Flatirons campus. I want to walk you through a couple of the pieces that you see in this image. And just above the kind of NREL hydrogen space, right there in the center, that's an electrolyzer. Uh, it is a one and a quarter megawatt electrolyzer. There's uh, compression, gaseous storage, and there's also a one megawatt fuel cell system uh, that they're the blue boxes. There's just a bunch of boxes. These boxes, though, are pretty fun when you put them together in a system. And so let's say we want to understand the flexibility aspect of a system. We want to understand the resiliency of a system or even the community uh, perspective of how you could use hydrogen as a dynamic load, how you could use hydrogen to support storage needs, how you could use hydrogen for mobility needs. This uh, capability, these sets of, of uh, pieces of equipment or boxes, we tie that into a whole system. This whole system has uh, essentially a brain that we call the controllable grid interface. So now we can go through and say, what happens with, um, uh, when the grid has a disturbance, or there's an extreme weather event, or there are things that are outside of the bounds of what we wanted to do for our normal operations. The hardware helps uh, ground us in reality. We can be pushing a lot with our analysis and our modeling and what we hope for or aspire to for 10 years or 20 years down the road, or even five years down the road. This research capability is essential to prove it. It proves out, it verifies or validates a, a new technology, or it verifies and validates how you would operate the system. A couple of examples of the research that we're using this capability for uh, include heavy-duty hydrogen fueling. So you're thinking about how do you make the hydrogen? How do you make the hydrogen hit or uh, get close to the hydrogen shot, which is the dollar per kilogram? Uh, that is a uh, aspirational goal. We're not there yet. And so we're studying the electrolyzer production of hydrogen and what are the keys to drive down costs. You certainly have electricity costs as the input. And you also have capital costs and operation, other operation costs for electrolyzer. So let's study that. Let's drive that down, see if we can get to the dollar per kilogram, and then how does that support heavy-duty fueling? 
Uh, there's also hybridization of a system that would help with the resiliency, a dynamic control. Um, say one part of the system goes down, does the electrolyzer, does stored hydrogen, do those things help us ride through an extreme weather event? So those are just a couple examples of the research that we're doing. Um, happy to talk and, and looking forward to the questions. Thanks. Hello, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for organizing this session. I'm a, I'm a water person, uh, and so when I hear people wanting to burn stuff, I have water ready to, to throw on the... <laughs> uh, let, me, let me get up here so that I, at least I don't take a nap, and I get to the first... Oh, I thought this was still the... Okay, so what's not to, to, to like about hydrogen is the generator of water. You, you burn it, you get water, and you get energy, two things that we desperately need. Uh, the devil is always in the details, and so when we start looking at what are the environmental impacts, the first thing that we... Oh, it's all right. here. Yes, right. The first thing that we think, okay, we're going to produce lots of hydrogen, this is going to escape, it's very volatile, it's going to go into the atmosphere, what's going to happen? And so one of the studies that we did, and the we is the Mostly the royal we, it's Matteo Bertani, who is sitting here, my postdoc, uh, Matteo, yes, <laughs> and, and the group of uh, uh, colleagues from GFDL and, and Princeton is, so once hydrogen gets into the atmosphere, it actually competes with the OH radical. And the, it wants to oxidize and produce water, but so does the methane, which is present and there is too much already in the atmosphere. It's a, it's a powerful greenhouse gas. And so by... Competing with, with methane, it actually oxidizes uh, OH, and uh, it, it gets OH, and uh, um, uh, methane doesn't get oxidized and stays longer in the atmosphere. So it increases the residence time. And so what Matteo did is to uh, develop a, a, mod, a chemistry model of the, of the atmosphere with these interactions and adding a pulse, a, a huge pulse of, of hydrogen comparable to what we would be emitting if we, if we develop a healthy and robust hydrogen economy. And what you see, sure enough, is a, a, a transient phase of growth of, of, hydro, of uh, methane, because we are continuing to emit uh, methane, and so a potential warming phase in the next 10, 20, even 30 years. That could be uh, extremely uh, problematic for us if we don't pay attention to the hydrogen emissions. So that's, that's the first message I, I want to have, and, and this is connected to that. This is just a, a, a simple analysis that follows this, this model uh, results. So just look at the, uh, at the triangles here. This is uh, critical emission of hydrogen, and how much can we afford uh, uh, emitting into the atmosphere without having this, uh, uh, this negative warming effect, this indirect effect of, as, as, of hydrogen as a, as a greenhouse gas. And, and so if you have a green hydrogen, which is attached to much less production of, uh, to, to basically no production of, of methane, we can actually emit up to 8% and still be relatively safe. But you have, if you have blue hydrogen, which comes together with emissions of, of methane from, from the fossil fuel industry um, uh, uh, pathway, then, then you can have, uh, you, you have much less uh, room for, for, for emissions, and actually uh, 4% or even less, depending on how, of course, how much uh, methane you also emit at that point, uh, uh, it becomes already problematic. So, so there is this aspect that needs to be uh, carefully considered. Emissions can be a problem and needs to be taken under control. So that, that's the first message uh, of, of my uh, quick uh, overview here. And uh, uh, the other thing that we explored is what happens once you have hydrogen in the atmosphere? You realize that the cycle of hydrogen is controlled by soil. Soil bacteria uh, are a sink of hydrogen. 75% uh, of the hydrogen in the atmosphere is consumed by, by soil bacteria, and mostly in semi-arid soils. And so uh, the analysis that, that Matteo did here is analyzing where this happens and how this could change in the future with, with climate change, with semi-arid systems changing places and becoming more or less 
uh, uh, prominent, also depending on the season. And so one of the concerns that we have is to realize, is to understand and predict how much of this sink will be present in the future and whether it would be enough to counteract potential increases of, of concentration of hydrogen in the atmosphere. And the second part, again, and very briefly here, is we heard about ammonia. Uh, hydrogen is, is difficult, difficult to move. We want to uh, produce ammonia to move it more easily and then either burn it or reconvert it back to hydrogen. Well, every time we touch the, the nitrogen cycle, it's potentially a big problem. We have done that with the Green Revolution, producing lots of fertilizer in the past 100 years, and we have passed already the planetary boundaries for, for safe uh, 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 perturbation of the nitrogen cycle. And so what we, what we can do here is potentially very, very problematic. We can emit directly ammonia, which is uh, uh, corrosive, it's toxic. We can actually emit uh, nitrogen oxides, which are uh, problematic for, for uh, uh, um, acid rains, for eutrophication, and probably, uh, more importantly, we can actually emit the nitrous oxide, which is N2O, which is one of the most powerful greenhouse gases, 300 times more powerful, more or less, than CO2. So if we don't burn it correctly, if we don't do th things properly, uh, potentially it could be it could be something that where where the, the cure is worse than the disease or or almost. And so we need to be very 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 careful with that. And uh, I'll leave you with these two slides. Uh, one being uh, here. The this was given by our collaborators in this project uh, uh, in combustion, Michael and and the other colleagues uh, uh, here at, at Princeton. Uh, the, the project has been very interesting. It, it involved also Emily Carter, uh, uh, who was here, who is here, and, uh, and uh, other colleagues, uh, again, Matteo, my postdocs. And uh, once you burn ammonia, uh, there are potentially imperfect combustions, productions, production of uh, uh, nitrogen oxides, uh, emission of uh, ammonia itself, and he, this, is the, this is the laughing gas, the nitrous oxide. There is really nothing to laugh about this gas. <laughs> this is the very powerful greenhouse gas. And so the, the calculation that, that we did, that Matteo did, is that even by letting 3 per, 4% of the ammonia that we plan to produce as N2O would be as bad as the current problem that we are producing with, with, green, with uh, fossil fuel. So potentially something that could be very, very uh, catastrophic. On the other hand, if we do it well, it could be potentially very beneficial. So we have these uh, two end members that, uh, that are uh, extremely, on the one hand, exciting, and on the other hand, uh, uh, problematic. And the other thing that we need to learn, uh, so the, the main message of my two hydrogen and ammonia uh, uh, brief uh, considerations here are emissions. We really need to plan for very low emissions. And we need to plan for low emission. We need to plan for very careful detection of emission. This is a picture uh, uh, from a satellite of uh, the ammonia emission from the largest power um, uh, uh, ammonia production plant in Louisiana in the, in the United States. And, and you see relatively large emissions taken from satellite. We need to do better. We need to get better resolution. We need to get uh, uh, more and more precise uh, uh, detection. This is uh, work that Mark Zondlo, our also collaborator on, on this paper that is coming out in, uh, in a few weeks, uh, has, has given us. So we are working on these lines to make sure that the, all of what we do here uh, is a cure, is a good medicine, and the side effects are as, 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 as low as possible. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for, for the perspectives. And uh, so we have a few uh, uh, questions that, uh, that we'll discuss, and then we want to open it up to, to you all uh, there. And so one of the things I'll start with for the panelists, and anyone can chime in on this one, is, is the time scales. Maybe not back to diapers with Jeff. That's a different story altogether that resonates with me because I changed diapers this morning, uh, my <laughs> son. Um, but you know, hydrogen is not something that is brand new that we've ever talked about before. Jeff mentioned it's been burned for quite some time. Even the notion of 
using hydrogen as an energy carrier is, is not new. I distinctly remember it was the 2003 State of the Union Address. Why? Because that was an assignment for my AP government course as a senior in high school, so I remember it very well. But that's when President Bush talked about his vision for the hydrogen economy, and that was 20 years ago. So, you know, maybe the first question for my panelists is, that was 20 years ago. Today we're talking about this a lot again. What's changed in the last two decades that changes from where we were back then? Well, let me jump in. Look, I, I think, first of all, I think there's a recognition fundamentally about the state of the planet, and I think we're all committed to doing something. This meeting alone is, is, is an indication of that. But going back to your question about scale and, and time scales, I think part of the question has to be re-asked is, for what? What am I using hydrogen for? What quantity do I need it at? What is the price point or cost tipping point where it makes economic sense and then it's easy to do? And depending on how you want to use hydrogen, the answer changes. And it's hard because we live in a capital-based society where everything is driven by financial metrics. You know, Yara, who's one of the largest you know, ammonia carrier companies in the world, has talked about wanting to you know, produce ammonia from, from renewable-based hydrogen. And the, and the headline of the article was that the, the agriculture industry doesn't want to pay a penny more for fertilizer even if it means reducing the carbon intensity because it goes to their bottom line and the people buying the fertilizer aren't incentivized to do it. So I don't think the implementation and the timescale issue is it's a matter of who's the end user, how do you set up the problem right. Ultimately, and we, I don't think these are technical problems. I can jump in to add to that. I don't know if you all uh, do this, but sometimes I think what kind of challenges from a researcher's perspective are technology? We don't, we need a solution. What kind of problems do we need a ton of money on? We're, we're seeing some of the hydrogen stuff now different than, than 20 years ago. There is a lot more money uh, for hydrogen. I think this is gonna be a <clears throat> wild social experiment to see how this changes the hydrogen scope. Um, I also think in um, 20 years ago, we were talking about potential and we were exploring what that potential could be. There's a great deal of analysis, techno-economic um, projections, thinking about what's possible. I started out at a fuel cell company right out of school, and I was tinkering on the fuel cell cars. We've seen a lot change, though, in the hydrogen fuel cell mobility space over the last 20 years. I think part of that State of the Union was something about everybody born now would be driving a fuel cell car. That one didn't hit. What that's enabled, though, is thinking about the consumer side, the product side, what's possible for hydrogen and mobility. It also significantly advanced manufacturing capabilities for fuel cells and electrolyzers. It has advanced um, our understanding of safety and the rigorous safety studies and research that's happened over the last 20 years. So those are a couple of things that I think about that have, that have changed. Well, if, I think I just want to reiterate the point of, of Jeff that is the urgency now. I think it's, uh, it's almost like the vaccines during COVID. We knew before we needed vaccines, but once COVID hit, we really needed vaccines. And so now we are really pushing for this and we're realizing that Exactly like the vaccines, we also need F FDA approval. We need to have uh, a solution that has uh, as few side effects as possible. And, and so this timing issue is really making things very challenging. It's not just technology. We can't, we can't just proceed slowly. And that's, that's, where, that's where the big, big challenge is. So then maybe a question for you, Tom, is, is you know, uh, some people knew about geological hydrogen before, but for some they learned something, which is great as an educator. If we learn something uh, in our afternoon, that's a good thing. So, you know, what is the potential for geological hydrogen? Is this something that, you know, we won't even talk about, you know, renewables, or is it something that's going to kind of play a niche role, um, you know, in the more long-term energy system? I don't, I don't see it as a niche role, but I, I like what Jeffrey said earlier. It's a... It's an and solution, not an or solution, right? I don't think there's anybody who's going to say we should have only one thing. 
I wouldn't see that geologic hydrogen is different. Um, rather than talking about our own company's estimates, I mean, the USGS put out a report talking about a, a trillion, you know, a TCF of, of, of hydrogen, or a trillion tons of hydrogen. Um, the numbers are going to depend on some time, but I think the reality is that the, the early work people are, are doing suggests it's a, a large, large volume of hydrogen, potentially at a low price. And so, I, you know, maybe this is a question also on the utilization side, you know, is if we did have a very large amount of very inexpensive hydrogen, what, what might change from the way people are thinking about energy systems now? What would that potentially enable uh, that, you know, we're not really seriously considering now? Look, if you've got enough that you can significantly change the dialogue, you know, and you've got cheap hydrogen, why wouldn't we start reducing the carbon intensity of sectors that use hydrogen already, fertilizer. We're not going to get rid of oil and gas in the time, so time soon, so as we think about using hydrogen refineries, why wouldn't we start reducing the carbon intensity of those industries? Because <laughs> the argument of it's not available and it doesn't have a low carbon intensity, it's not cheap. If you remove those arguments, you know, that's a pathway to do that. But I think it comes down to what's the price point and can you then just replace the existing default? Everyone wants the cheapest thing, and if the cheapest thing is now also better for the environment, that's a, that's a no-brainer kind of decision. I think industrial processes is absolutely the more hydrogen that you get. There's 10 million um, metric tons of hydrogen used in the U.S. annually. It is here. It is used a lot. So to change the source of that will allow us to get into industrial um, processes in, in different ways. I think that that's... That's really key. We're already seeing some strain on the supply of hydrogen, though, um, with more and more demand for it. Where do you get it, uh, and how do you store it? The bulk storage uh, aspects, you know, if uh, geological storage could open up a, a very different perspective. Um, we've already always talked about um, cavern storage for hydrogen if you're making it from renewables, but that's a, a very specific uh, geospatial challenge and solution. We've got to have a wider range of solutions for bulk hydrogen storage, too. And um, I think, again, trying to tie it back to the, to the question of what does it open up, um, we're, we're already tapped out almost on, on hydrogen right now. So we've got to add in more of the supply, supply um, pathways. And, and that's using existing technologies primarily. And what's interesting is, when you talk to folks and they say, we really want to do things and we want to have hydrogen with lower carbon intensity, and just take price off the table for the moment. There isn't enough supply to do anything rationally. Some of the projects we do with our customers where they want to demonstrate hydrogen use in a gas turbine and they want specifically hydrogen that's coming from renewables, hydrogen that's been produced by electrolysis, go talk to an industrial gas company and talk about, you want a couple tube trailers of the stuff over a couple of weeks? Are they even able to supply that? When we did this demonstration last spring, we consumed six trailers of, of, we'll call it green hydrogen just to make life easy, in an afternoon. And we needed three afternoons like that. And we basically, you know, you know um, not literally, but figuratively, put like a headlock on green hydrogen supply. Because the amount of green hydrogen that was available, we were consuming a large portion of that in the Northeast all of a sudden. And so, it's not that people don't want to do this, but how do you build up that supply chain? It's not just production. It's, as you said, Jennifer, it's storage, it's transportation. It's all these other pieces that we actually need to consider. And there are 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline in the US along the Gulf Coast to support refinery operations. If we're going to make hydrogen of whatever color you want on the East Coast or West Coast, how do you get it to the end user? Is it about localization of production? Um, you know, is it salt cavern storage? Is it transformation to a molecule that's easier to store? Mm -hmm. And so I think industry, government partnership as we think about these challenges, because there's not one solution. Right. Um, but I love the idea of, of industrialization, replace the hydrogen with the high carbon content with hydrogen with a lower carbon intensity. And maybe in the near term, you don't even open up anything new. You just enable uh, more utilization Low carbon intensity, I think, is a great way to, to think about it um, right now. Mm -hmm. And for all of this, I think um, we've got goals that are 10 years and, and 20 years out, but we still have to figure out how to go from where we are right now 
to get to those long-term goals. And that's going to be part of the, the where we need that supply, um, more options. Maybe a question uh, for Jeff is, you know, everything in life, there's always temporal mismatches. And product development is always a place where that can go. And, you know, maybe we'll use like ammonia gas turbines as an example. Um, you alluded to starting to develop ammonia gas turbines, but there's not really a market for those because there's no green ammonia in mass quantity to actually consume. And so how does, you know, how does, how, how does your company, how do companies generally think about kind of navigating that market product trade off and walking that yep. fine line to creating something they can't sell versus desperately needing to create something because there's a huge market and they're behind the curve? Part of it is, um, you know, an engagement with our customers, engagement with the industries, reading the tea leaves. What are government policymakers talking about around the world and who are they talking to? Who are the think tanks? And, you know, you start looking at countries like Singapore, um, Japan, South Korea, who have no choice but to start thinking about how to transform their societies. Countries that are dependent today on importation of carbon-based energy sources. Countries that really won't be able to do nuclear and, let's say, renewables at scale. Well, they're going to start importing a new energy source. And they've started to do the math, and they start off, hydrate's great, and then someone told them, oh, minus 253 degrees C versus minus 30 degrees C, do the math, and they go, oh, okay, maybe we're not going to import hydrogen. Well, then they start moving down the list of molecules. And so, you know, from our perspective, it's about trying to be ahead of the curve, looking around the corner and saying, okay, what could be happening in 2030? And it's about starting to put the fundamental research in place and thinking about what are the things you need to have ready. It's not that we're going to build the technology and have the gas turbine sitting in a warehouse and when someone orders it, we're ready to ship it, but to be close enough that when we see the kind of the tipping point in the market, we're not just... We're not just starting from scratch. We've already built a foundation. And I think that would be true in any industry, that you try and look around the corners and see what the trends are, and can you be a little better prepared so you're not starting from zero. And some of that means doing neat collaborations with research institutions that can do the fundamental research, and we can then apply it in the industrial setting. And collaborating with partners like the DOE and others, again, who can, again, we can see around corners together, and the DOE can say, hey, I know the technology is not ready for commercialization, but it could be, we might need it. So we can partner with a public-private partnership and help prepare that. So there's a lot of ways to do it, but you, 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 gotta, you can't just think about today. You gotta think about the, the scenario of what could be in the future and how would you be ready for it. And it's, it's not even a full-time job. It's like lots of full-time jobs. <laughs> Fair enough. So maybe a question for, for Jen. You mentioned your, 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 your background in fuel cells as well. And so in, in full disclosure, I thought it would be funny to put a United Technologies fuel cell person next to a GE gas turbine person. That would be a <laughs> We're going to fight later. But, you know, we, we don't really have a huge amount of fuel cell vehicles. And so, you know, a question that the students often ask me is, you know, electrochemical conversion in a fuel cell versus, you know, gas-based chemistry in a gas turbine. What is the role for fuel cells? You know, where are we going to see their role? Is it vehicle scale? Is it grid scale? Is it something in between, you know? Uh, I mean, UTC actually started, for those of you who are history buffs, as basically servicing the Apollo program, but that's yeah. a very limited market. So where are we going to see these in the future? <laughs> it is limited. Um, you know, I think that there is absolutely a place, especially in the heavy-duty and off-road um, uh, mobility sector for fuel cells. I think combustion is absolutely one of those avenues, and it's that balance between what can we do right now and what are we going to do in a couple decades? So with the uh, fuel cell applications, if it's stationary, stationary fuel cells have been around for almost as long as Apollo. And, and they can provide uh, base load power really well. What opens up when you use fuel cells is as you can drive costs down, particularly in manufacturing and volume, you can actually have a very dynamically controlled uh, generator, uh, if you will. And so I think that there are avenues where you will see them in the stationary um, market. You see them there now, baseload. What happens with uh, when we get um, a much more integrated um, uh, system between our generation and our demands? I think fuel cells play a good role there because they can be controlled. I also think, again, in that mobility space, the heavy-duty off-road is absolutely going to be an avenue. And with the um, blending 
and the combustion side, uh, we talked about low carbon intensity. I don't think it gets us all the way there. And so that's why we still have to have this intermediate set of uh, goals and longer range goals. So maybe then before we go to the audience, a question for Milkeray on how we should think about environmental impacts of our future energy systems. So with hydrogen and ammonia, you kind of alluded to you know, the atmospheric and some of the soil issues, and I'll call them more global scale environmental impacts as well. But you, know, you can view hydrogen as an energy storage technology, not so different, say, than uh, electrochemical cells, batteries. And they have a totally different type of environmental impact, which is hyper-local, where you mine the materials and things like that. And so how do we weigh global environmental impacts versus local environmental impacts? And in some sense, do we sacrifice local you know, environment for the global environment? Uh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so first of all, Again, as, as it has been said, it's, it's a problem of using different things. I don't think it's one versus the other. Um, so, so, yes, hydrogen and ammonia, if we can do them well, and they're wonderful storage uh, uh, pathways, fantastic. Uh, batteries, we, we use them already. Uh, we, we really don't look much of to where things come, Chile, um, uh, China, and so on. Uh, the, the, the lithium, for example, but, but there are lots of local important consequences for soil, and not just local, uh, groundwater is, it, but, but less visible because they're in the soil, or groundwater where people don't see that. So uh, I don't think we should choose one or the other, we just need to be do, doing due diligence on all of that. And one thing that also we need to be careful, I think, uh, the idea of recycling is, is beautiful, but it's also a bit dangerous in the sense that recycling doesn't mean 100% perfect process, and we need to keep that in mind. Also, when we just produce our garbage, no? Oh, I'm going to recycle the, 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 the glass, no worries. I'm going to recycle paper so I can consume more, no? That, that's not the approach. Uh, we, we need to be careful because every time we, we, we try to recycle something, there is an inefficiency, and, and so we still need more uh, of... of uh, and and we, we have seen what happens in... Uh, uh, in the aquifers in Chile for, for, for lithium and so on. And those are things that are irreversible in the sense that fixing an aquifer and, and uh, uh, remediating a soil is basically almost impossible at, at, at the scales that we're interested in. So uh, let's just be careful and, and do things uh, properly without choosing a, a single solution. Okay. All right, well, we have about 15 minutes left in our panel, so we want to open up the floor to you all for questions. And the only rule is you can't ask about carbon for the hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was uh, Emily Carter. Uh, that, that was very interesting. I um, was particularly struck by the fact that, that um, you, Tom, said that there could be up to a trillion tons of hydrogen coming from geological hydrogen. And I wanted to know, so I have a question and then I have a comment. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a slight hog. Um, so with respect to that, is that hydrogen that already exists in reservoirs is the, is the estimate? Or is that assuming that one finds a way to accelerate serp serpentinization or I think, both? I, uh, I think the USGS numbers, I'll, I'll cite theirs, uh, are a trillion uh, kilograms of hydrogen existing in natural reservoirs as the gas in place estimates. A trillion ga kilograms. Yeah. Okay, that's and a that, different And then number. about 10x that for serpentinization enhancement. Is the, huh. Okay, so the it's the combination numbers. of the two. Okay, thank you. And then the, this is my comment. Um, the, the concept of storing hydrogen as hydrogen, yes, it can be done, but of course hydrogen basically leaks out of anything, okay, and embrittles metals and et cetera, et cetera. So to me it seems like the, the answer has to be that mostly what we're doing is making hydrogen on demand and that we're not doing long-term storage. I mean, there is geological places where one can store, as you, you've mentioned, but it'd be better to be building out places where one can do hydrogen on, on demand. And one of the issues that you brought up, um, you, you mentioned this very interesting experiment where you ended up using almost all the green hydrogen in, in a few afternoons or something. So what are the prospects in your mind, I guess I would, I would direct this to Jeff mostly, for scale up at the scale that one could imagine 
using it, not just for the uses today, but for uses, for example, for carbon utilization where it's mm -hmm. going to be critical. Um, you, what are the, so scale up of green hydrogen in particular, what are your thoughts about that? Um, do you have an afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you got 30 seconds. <laughs> um, look, it, it's challenging because, you know, production on demand is going to be challenging because some of the demand uses are going to be massive in scale. So you have to think about if you're using hydrogen, let's say, as a feedstock for a synthetic fuel or for a feedstock, the reactor that the hydrogen's feeding is probably not going to want to be a batch system. We, these reactions like to be continuous. And now, boy, hydrogen demand is probably not the right thing. I've got to have some sort of buffered storage. Or maybe it's storage not of hydrogen, but it's storage of electricity so I can consume, produce hydrogen at a steady state, and I scale the end production process based on that. So you, we may have to start rethinking about how we design process plants because yeah, I now to have to match the fluxes, right, basically. And I, and I may not design for max capacity of output. I might design for min capacity of input. And you might start to think about, do I have to do regionalization? There, there's a lot of really challenging things here. Um, do you even store hydrogen as hydrogen if you've got long-term viability? Do you take the energy penalty of switching to a different molecule? It, it may depend on what your end ultimate use is. So I, I don't think there's an answer, but there are is a lot of problems. Maybe some really smart Princeton postdocs want to think about. Um, <laughs> but it's going to take time to figure this all out. Look, we, we can't even make more than a small amount of our total consumption of hydrogen as, as renewable or green. And then you've got challenges of if, I'm, if it's truly renewable, where is the electron coming from? Am I, what am I co-locating? Am I collating production of electricity and hydrogen production or hydrogen production and end use? And what am I moving? And am I doing my things on grid or off grid policy and interconnect? There is not an answer because this is a spider web of problems, all interconnected. So I, I, sorry, I don't have a really good answer that's succinct and simple. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to add, it's a balancing problem with demand and, and generation, for sure. And so that has a number of scenarios that you could go off of it. There's also been a lot of advancements with hydrogen storage. Uh, for instance, one of the things that we're looking at in the uh, next couple of months is a metal hydride storage, 500 kilograms or so. And electrolyzers are really good at producing hydrogen 24-7. Uh, they've been used uh, around um, in, in a lot of places. So they can be dynamically controlled. One of the tricks is as you drive out cost, uh, in particular for the electrolyzer uh, materials, it tends to negatively impact durability. And durability is impacted based on cycles of operation. So your transients and your start and stops, things like that. So it, it has... There are some fundamental aspects where you could be looking at the uh, on-demand or longer-term storage. Uh, gaseous storage right now, you could store a fuel cell car in a garage, uh, and without a catastrophic failure, you would keep that hydrogen in that system for, for weeks and weeks, uh, you know, and that, that's going to be okay. So I think it's all in, in the finer details, as you mentioned. And scale matters. Yeah. Uh, so this, is, this question is related to a lot of what's come up on the panel around the questions that still exist around the future and the, the problems that need to be solved around transportation and the questions around monitoring and the um, atmospheric effects of released hydrogen. There, there's so many questions that um, I, I wanted to know what the panel um, makes of the fact that tens of billions of dollars of spending on hydrogen production and infrastructure is already committed. And there are forecasts of spending upwards of tens of tr trillions of dollars on hydrogen over the next decades. Um, it's a little confusing to, to contemplate those numbers in the context of some of the giant question marks that the panel has, has raised. So I'd like to hear your reaction to, to those forecasts. But before I do, I want to share a tiny anecdote with the hydrogen combustion fans on the panel, because you just reminded me of something I did in eighth grade when I sneaked a... Um, test tube of hydrochloric acid and a few pellets of zinc out of the classroom. And I um, made hydrogen uh, behind the garage and lit it on fire and it caused a gigantic explosion. So um, <laughs> I've, I've never said this in public before, but this seems like the perfect forum to share that. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Exploration. I think, I think we have huge questions about almost every aspect of our energy transition. I think 
that those questions don't concern me from our ability to rise to the challenge to meet them. Uh, I, I do think that investment is necessary, especially as we consider that this energy transition uh, that needs to happen, and it needs to happen fast, is not going to be just for a handful of people who can afford it. It needs to be for all. And those, that goal is, it just is loaded with questions. And, and we've got to be paying attention to it. The, I think the challenges that we've talked about here, um, I've been working in hydrogen for 20 years. I haven't changed course. I think that, uh, so that's how I kind of digest your question a little bit. If I didn't think that there was a, a real potential here to be part of the solution, I'd be doing something different. Uh, but that's a, a little bit of a biased answer, too. Uh, I'd say, and I, and I say this to a lot of folks, I don't think the challenges we face in front of us are that we don't understand the science or that we need new science. Right? This is not about inventing new. This is about the practical application of what we, need, of what we know today at scale. The problem is we're being asked to basically change our entire society's usage and dependence on energy in a few decades but it took us a century or more to get here. So the pace of change we're being asked to do means there are going to be a lot of questions that we're going to have to answer on the fly because we're being asked to make changes at a pace that, that is just faster than we can sort of humanly contemplate. I'm, not, I'm OK with that as long as we're honest about it, that there are these open questions that we have to be diligent and honest and transparent about what that means. And if we learn something as a community that's an oops, we have to go, OK, how do we, we address that? Change right. course. Right. Yeah. But we can do that, but we also means we have to have an honest dialogue with our policymakers, and they've got to be partners with us that if, if the scientific community realizes we've got to make a pivot, they've got to be able to pivot with us. And that's an important dialogue that we should all be having with our policymakers because they need to understand that we don't have the answers. It's not like you can pull out the energy transition handbook and the problems to the homework are in the back, right? We don't know the answers. We don't even know all the questions yet. But will they be willing partners as we learn and go? Uh, yes, we have lots of questions. But we also felt good when we saw, for example, that the clear message is reduce emissions, reduce fugitive emissions, and keep them below a certain threshold as we think of that. I think at the same time, we, we have this urgency. So seeing investments and seeing plans to produce is also what we need to see. Otherwise, if we wait. Uh, so we have this double-edged sword. I think another reason I'm optimistic is the, the question is not using hydrogen at scale, right? That's, that's already being done at scale now. It's the question of using green hydrogen, right? Like we can, there's a lot of learning in what's already happened in the use of mm -hmm. hydrogen to date. Yep. Um, following up on all of the questions that have been asked so far, I'm wondering if anyone knows what fraction of the uh, very large sum of money that's going into hydrogen research is now being directed toward minimization of leaks and what fraction should be? I don't know off the top of my head what that fraction is. I know uh, just from one little uh, dot of, of what's happening, we've got uh, fairly extensive research on our um, uh, millions of dollars a year in hydrogen safety and also in understanding the, the impacts of leakage or minimizing leakage, and also the monitoring. So what are the, the communications controls and monitoring aspects that are happening? But I don't know a specific number of the, of the percentage. I think each hub is going to be talking about this. There's, from the Department of Energy side, uh, they have had a uh, hydrogen safety panel that's staffed with uh, researchers as well as industry <coughs> experts. And so oftentimes, that's one of uh, the key resources that I use when I think about uh, a part of your question. I want to add, uh, the hydrogen is only an indirect uh, greenhouse gas if there is methane present. So it's not just reducing hydrogen, but we need to also have very little methane. If there is no methane, hydrogen doesn't interact. I mean, interacts, but doesn't. It's, it's the effect of keeping longer methane in the atmosphere, that, that is problematic. <laughs> but there is also anthropogenic one. <laughs> I do think we need more data uh, to help us quantify 
the problem too. I, I did a slide this morning on the enormous uncertainties in long run demand for electricity. And you may remember <clears throat> it had terms like, gee, if we do electrochemical primary metallurgy, then we don't need a whole lot of electricity to make a bunch of green hydrogen for hybrid and so on. Well, you could make exactly the same kind of slide for huge uncertainties in hydrogen demand. If you look at recent developments in aviation, it looks like that's probably a smaller market than we thought for hydrogen. The truck market turns out not to be interesting for in, in almost all cases uh, because batteries and efficiency do the same thing a lot cheaper. Uh, <clears throat> the Hosseini and Livingood NREL paper on competition with storage pretty much knocked the stuffing out of the argument you need a lot of hydrogen for long-term grid backup. Um, and the, you know, similarly to some degree from the Fimsikert study for Europe. But now think about, again, the primary metallurgy problem as being relatively small compared to the game changer that Dr. Dara is talking about. Uh, if geological hydrogen turns out to be a real big thing, uh, <clears throat> we won't need to make a whole lot of it because we can extract it probably a lot more cheaply. And as I understand it, the co-product industrial gases can often pay for the extraction, so it's roughly free FOB wellhead. Uh, well, what does that, if, if that perception becomes widely accepted, one of the first things that happens is the long-term asset value of oil in the ground goes to about zero because hydrogen will undercut just the lifting cost of the cheapest Middle East oil let alone having to refine transport and, and deliver it. Uh, so that changes not just geopolitics, but a whole lot of perception in the energy market, ability of the hydrocarbon industries to raise capital and so on. How is the hydrogen community thinking about this enormous range of uncertainty in long-term demand for hydrogen? And is that inhibiting or should it add more caution to some of our investments today? Or should we just get on with rapid expansion and try to learn fast enough that we don't overshoot and have a bunch of pre-stranded assets? I think that um, my, per, my take on the investments and the opportunity for hydrogen, uh, let's just 10 million metric tons annually used right now, and that's for uh, where we are. We have to get from, from this point into a uh, future energy state, which means hydrogen's part of it. Uh, the heavy duty applications, the uh, off road, the mining, even if the demand is a little bit lower than what projections are right now, it's still there. I don't think that uh, all of the electrified solutions are going to be the answer. Uh, I don't think that's, that's possible for the wide range of scenarios that we've got with our energy system. I think we have to continue investing in hydrogen. We have to, um, uh, this is a little bit of doing things faster. There's some risk with doing it faster and doing parts of this in parallel. And that's, I think, what we're talking about with some of this investment. You are still pursuing an understanding of the options and also going through and saying, okay, hydrogen for aspects of mobility, hydrogen, um, uh, that supports other industrial processes. So there is absolutely risk associated with that. And uh, part of, I think, what we all need to be doing is how do we manage that risk? What mitigation uh, pieces do we put in place? I don't have a, I mean, that's a pretty big, big question. I don't have a specific answer for you on that, but I think we have to keep going. Hydrogen is going to be part of our future energy system. I, to me, the answer is there is no one singular solution that solved this problem. If the estimates of, of geologic hydrogen are right, and it's abundant in many places of the world, that's wonderful. But there are places that won't have it. And what do you do to those places? Are those places now going to have to import ammonia made from that or methanol made from that, or they're going to be all renewable-based? There, there is no singular answer. But we can also focus on not just the production, but I think investments in end use of the hydrogen, what it gets used for, are not wasted. Because if it turns out you get a lot of hydrogen that's available cheaply, but you've invested in how to use the hydrogen, 
Well, you just won because now you just incentivize those technologies because you got a cheaper source. Um, thank you for the, the great panel. I'm David Paolella from Breakthrough Energy. And my question is again on the, the leaks of both leak potential for ammonia and hydrogen. Since these are both industries that exist at you know, relatively large scale today globally, I'm wondering what we can learn from those existing industries, uh, which presumably have some standards around uh, making sure that there are not leaks that, you know, um, I, in the case of hydrogen are explosive potentially, or ammonia um, have all the different environmental impacts that you listed. So I'm just wondering how much the solutions for addressing those leaks already exist and maybe just need to be scaled up. Uh, you make a great, great point. Hydrogen safety, uh, we have done significant more hydrogen safety uh, research and deployment of those technologies than anything we use at a gas station. Uh, and we're absolutely building off of that. I think the piece there is uh, continuing to understand the cost uh, impacts of the safety and, and monitoring. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, you know, it's a gas that's had a lot of study put on it, right? In terms of leaks, in terms of its dispersion, um, the material embrittlement, uh, it's a pretty wealthy set of, of um, scientific understanding. Look, I would say again, I don't think the issue here is do we know how to detect it? The science is there. For the large oil and gas companies, the math has been really simple. It's actually cheaper to just put more oil and gas into the pipeline and to solve the leakage problem. Because the leakage problem is a dispersed problem. You've got to look at every mile of pipeline to figure out where the leaks are from. And we're, you know, the last couple of years, it's really be able to do it more in an autonomous fashion versus having someone to walk those miles. But you ask, you ask a company, why aren't you solving the leak problem? It's because it's cheaper not to. And these companies make decisions based on profitability. Change the equation. Put a penalty on leakage that is more expensive then the solution, the problem goes away quickly. Um, companies are motivated, publicly traded companies are motivated, motivated by stock price and profitability. This is not a science problem. Hydrogen, Jen, I think we maybe solved the problem, right? We've done the science. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to laugh so hard, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're basically done. <laughs> but th there are also interesting scientific problems, like, like the one of N2O for, for combustion, no? just optimizing combustion disease. I mean, Michael, you speak, I, I shouldn't speak for you and, and your colleagues, but it is still at the forefront of optimization, no? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I mean, if, if you want to go to ammonia, the N2O is a big unknown in terms yeah. of the emissions, mm -hmm. and that's where the technology development yep. would be on, on that front. And, and from the detection point of view, at larger scale, uh, we are also still working on that. Uh, you, you can see my colleague Mark Zondlo who is actually working actively on detecting, uh, like detecting ammonia, it's, it's a very short-lived uh, gas, and so you have to get it when, when it's out and, and at the right uh, resolution, so, so it's, it's not easy. Okay, I think we'll leave it at that. Let's thank the panel again.